Good evening. Good evening. Time to get started. So we are going to open with the word of prayer. Let us pray. Our Father and our God in heaven, we thank you for this day. Father, we thank you for all the many blessings that you have supplied. And Father, we realize that you do uh, so much that we are unable to know, so much that goes unseen. But Father, we thank you for your loving kindness, for your grace and mercy that sustains us from one day to the next. We ask, O oh God, that you continue to be with us, continue to guide us. Father, we are grateful for the privilege that is ours to be gathered together this evening in this place. We ask that you would guide us as we uh, search together through your word, grant that we would better understand uh, your will and your way, that we might be better equipped to serve you in the living of these days. Father, of all, we thank you for Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior, who makes it all possible. And in his name we do pray and ask all things. Amen. Uh, so we stopped. I, that, I don't know that there's ever going to be a time that we don't stop in the middle of something. Uh, but we had read Joshua 1, 1 through 9. I want to reread that just to get a running start at where we'll be uh, this, oh, this evening. Did I go back too far? I did that because I backed it up. Okay, there we go. Uh, can we get a reader for Joshua 1, 1 through 5? Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Now it came about after the death of Moses, uh, the servant of the Lord, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, uh, Moses' servant, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now therefore arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people to the land which I am given to them, uh, to the sons of Israel. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I have given it uh, to you. Just as I spoke to Moses from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and as far as the great sea toward the setting of the sun, Will be your territory. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Thank you, sir. Uh, can you get somebody else to pick it up at uh, verses six through nine? Joshua one six through nine. Okay, that's good because we got a couple people in the on deck position. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may be uh, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law, uh, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened, and do not be dismayed. For the, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. There are a number of things that we want to observe as we read this. Uh, I believe in looking at just how difficult the Israelites could be, we see... Uh, the man Moses was. And remember, God chose Moses deliberately. Uh, now the torch passes to Joshua. God chooses Joshua deliberately. Uh, and it took a special person uh, to lead Israel. Because uh, we've seen they would murmur just for the sake of murmuring. Uh, but as much as we notice Moses and Joshua, uh, let us not miss the almighty God who was picking the right person 
at the right time uh, for the job. And when you read the Bible record, God consistently picked the right person uh, for the, for the, uh, at the right time for, for the particular job. Now, this is his word of encouragement to Joshua. And after 40 years of watching what they did to Moses, he needed God to talk to him uh, and encourage him because this is not a light work that he's about to take on. Uh, so when we look here, uh, and I didn't, I don't know why, indicate that that's Joshua 1, uh, verse number 2. But notice what it says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, cross this Jordan, you and all these people, to the land which I am giving to them, to the sons of Israel. I don't know if we appreciate, you know, when you deal with people, how attached we can get to uh, a particular person. Now, I grew up at the uh, Central Congregation in Baltimore, and until they sent me to Cambridge, the only preacher I had ever known was Humphrey Fowles. So when you talk about somebody else to this day, somebody, you know, when they talk about the minister at Central, in my mind, I see Brother Faust because for, you know, all my life from the time I'm a toddler till I'm a, an adult, he was the preacher. Well, Moses had been the leader of Israel for 40 years. The good, the bad, otherwise Moses has been the man uh, that they have looked to now when Moses died anybody remember how long the Bible says they mourned uh, Moses death you want to talk about a long funeral you want to peek over at Deuteronomy 34 verse 8 Deuteronomy 34, verse 8. Can you imagine the nation mourning for a whole month? Now, this is not individuals still hurting. This is the nation mourning for a month. Now, I've been to some long funerals, but let me tell you, 30 days for the whole nation to be mourning uh, is a long time. That, that detail is there deliberately because we need to appreciate just how attached Israel had become to Moses. So now God says to Joshua, I want you to step in and pick up where I left off with Moses. That's a huge undertaking because you know how people are. Well, if Moses... I bet Joshua heard Moses' name almost every time he went to do something. Yeah, especially if something went wrong. Man, if Moses was still here. And these are the folk that murmured. You know, we tired of this light bread. We don't have anything to drink. Now, they murmured more than a little bit at Moses. But people being people, I bet you Joshua heard Moses' name uh, all the time. But look what God says. Moses was my servant. Moses wasn't the man pulling the strings. Moses was just the tool that God was using. Now, notice that Moses is dead. Now, Moses is dead, but guess who's not? God. God is not dead. Yeah, well, Joshua wasn't dead yet either. They, they probably helped him <laughs> in that regard. Uh, but yet, God is not dead. So, a great leader has died. But your source of provision is well and fine. That Brother Keeper would say he, he ain't even sick. So as much as we look at one another, we ought to do like uh, the Hebrew writer, I almost called the name, like the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews, we ought to look to Jesus. We, we always want to look to the Lord more than we do to people. Now, Moses has died. Uh, but he tells Joshua, I want you to finish the work that I've been doing for 40 years uh, through Moses. Now, you don't think that took some faith? And not faith in the people, because the people were going to be who they were. Uh, not faith in himself, because he didn't have the ability to lead the people. 
This one called for some absolute uh, faith in God. And I would submit to you that faith and obedience are the building blocks of Christian character. Without those two, you can have anything else you want. But the end result is you're not going to have a good Christian. You got to have faith in God. In fact, what does Hebrews 11, 6 tell us? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Yeah. And not just I believe God in terms of lip service, but I'm willing to do what he has said as unbelievable uh, as it may seem. Uh, Romans 3, mm, Romans 5, 3 through 5, uh, we had a couple of people in the, in the bullpen. Uh, Brother Holt's already written. Romans 5, 3 through 5. And not only this, but we also exalt in tribulations, knowing that tribulations bring about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Now, when you read uh, Romans 5, 3 to 5, you don't see the words faith or obedience, uh, but don't miss their prominence in what Paul is saying here. Uh, when you face trouble, let me tell you, you better have some faith in God and you better be willing to do what God says. Uh, because you'll never get to the other things in the list uh, uh, if you don't. So a very important part of what God said to Joshua uh, concerned faith and obedience. Joshua, I know I've called you for a huge task. I know these people. I know they don't cooperate. I know they'll turn on you at the drop of a dime. Uh, but if you will trust me, uh, then everything is going to work. And not only does he tell Joshua, I want you to lead the people, uh, but he says, I want you to lead them across the Jordan River. Now, I think you remember from last week, we talked about at this time, the Jordan River has overflowed its banks. Uh, I may guess that it's somewhere around 15 feet above flood level. Now, can you imagine taking that bunch that would complain we don't have nothing to drink, we don't have anything to eat, we tired of eating the same old thing every day. Take that bunch and you're going to lead them across this river that's overflowed uh, its banks. Brother Foster. In concert with what you're saying about the dangers of getting across, but I'm just thinking about Joshua. Joshua was so special. If you think about when God dealt with Job, he didn't talk to him like he's talking to Joshua. Mm -hmm. And Joshua, I'm sure, could say, we're going to get across because God told me. And what a special relationship mm -hmm. that that must have been. My servant Moses is dead, but now I'm talking to you personally, and I'm giving you my assurance that I'm going to be with you. What a tremendous, mm -hmm. tremendous vote of confidence. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and I don't think it's coincidence that of the 12 spies, Joshua was one of the people that came back uh, with, with a positive uh, uh, report. So God tells Joshua, I want you to take this people across the Jordan, overflowing its banks. And, of course, we are trying to make relevant application uh, from what we read there. So think of the Jordan River, Jordan River as being symbolic of obstacles that we face in life. Anybody ever run into something and if it was up to you, you would just turn around and go back and not deal with it? It, it might be in your home. It might be on your job. Uh, you know, sometimes it can be uh, with you. You ever go to the doctor and he tell you something, and if it was up to you, you'd act like you never went to the doctor in the first place and heard him say what he said? Uh, they tell me one of the things that they do if you're going to have surgery, I don't know, Brother Johnson would know, is that they talk to you about what they're going to do to you and why they need to do it. We're gonna, and I'm sure you, he doesn't say we're going to cut you open and do I'm sure that's not how they go about it, but once I understand you want to cut me open, uh-uh, not on purpose. 
Uh, no, thank you. But appreciate one of the ways that God builds character is through us facing uh, obstacles. Uh, and I have one here. There can be no successful crossing of our Jordans without faith. Uh, the greatest hindrance to spiritual growth is our own uh, lack, of, uh, lack of faith. And I mean that on an individual basis. A lot of times people try to blame the church. No, I am what I am because that's what I choose to be uh, individually. Uh, whatever else may be going on uh, around me. Remember, the older generation is going to miss the promised land, uh, the Hebrew writer tells us, because of unbelief. Unbelief is the opposite of faith. They knew what God said, and they just didn't trust God to do what he said. We can't beat them folk over there. They're too big. God says, I give you the land. We can't beat them. So now, if this was, you know, growing up in the time that I came through, God would say, so you're telling me I'm lying. That, that's the kind of conversation uh, that, that you would have. So every obstacle, every dilemma that we face in life doesn't challenge us to the same extent, but there will come uh, that dilemma that causes us to acknowledge, you know what, I can't do this by myself. You ever, you ever face something and you figure, I got a plan. If I do this, if I do that, and if I do the other, I'll be good. Now, you know, unexpected bill comes up. Well, if I cut back for three months over here, I can cover it, and after that, I'll be good. Sometimes we think we can handle things. Uh, sometimes you face that thing, and you know, start not. If God don't bless me, I've had it. This, 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 this is just over. And this has been the case uh, throughout Bible times. You look at Jacob. Uh, Jacob was one of the uh, greats in the Bible. Not all the issues he had in his house notwithstanding. Uh, Jacob was a great man. Can we get somebody to read that? Genesis uh, 32, 11 through 12. Got brother. Oh, okay. Well, we'll do ladies first. We'll do Sister Jerry. Brother, we'll be uh, to you next. Genesis 32, 11 and 12. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, that he will come and attack me and the mothers of the children. For you said I will surely prosper and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, of the sea which is too great to be numbered. So you, you see repeatedly through the Bible this promise that God made to Abraham. But look at what Jacob says. I am afraid of my brother. Why did Jacob leave home? Well, yeah, he did steal a birthright. And what was Esau's reaction to that? Esau, the one he stole it from. Yeah, Esau was going to kill him. Just, just sure as this business with daddy is over, because their father had just died. As soon as this business with daddy is over, it's going to be another funeral. That was Esau's reaction. So Jacob ran away from home, running really from Esau. Well, it so happens he's getting ready to cross paths with Esau again. Now, far as he knows, the last he heard, Esau wanted to make him a dead man. And in his mind, ain't nothing changed. So he just said, look, I'm a Lord, I'm afraid of him. Uh, we don't like to admit that we're afraid of things, do we? Uh, especially uh, those of us that are of the male gender. You know, fear is not something that you readily uh, admit. Uh, but he just says, in this case, I am afraid, and he tells us why, that he will come and attack me and the mothers with the children. I'm afraid he's going to come in here and wipe out everybody. And then he, you know, funny, going to remind God what he said. You promised that you would make me and my descendants as the sand, well, this, he said this to Abraham. Of course, Jacob is through Abraham's line. So for God to keep his promise, Jacob can't die. Or at least if he killed me, you got to raise me back up. This can't be the end of the story if, if in fact, Lord, uh, you telling the truth. So Jacob faced an obstacle. And Jacob just says, 
I'm afraid. We don't like to admit that we're afraid, but there are times that we are. The real problem is when we let fear cripple us. Anybody tell you they're not afraid of anything is probably being dishonest. That or they haven't run up against the right thing or the wrong thing as, as the case may be. Uh, but they say being afraid is not the problem. It's when you let fear cripple you to inaction. Uh, one of the things I hate to see on a TV movie, you ever seen one of these movies where they're getting chased and the person gets so scared they just stand there? I'm like, fear, I have never run as fast as when I'm afraid. Anybody ever been chased by a dog? I've never been clocked when I've been chased by a dog. But I would venture that that was probably some of the fastest running I've done uh, in my life. Yeah, so Jacob, Joshua, fill in the blank, me, whoever the case might be, you cannot cross your Jordan uh, without faith. We're going to face some obstacles. If it was up to me, I'd choose to turn around and go back, but you got to trust God. Uh, to bring you through. Now, trusting God to bring you through is different from telling God how it has to play out. That's two different things. Now, when God tells you how it's going to turn out, we have every right to expect that. But when God hadn't told us how it's going to turn out, and in our minds, this is, Lord, is what you're going to do, now we're making demands of God, which we have no right to do. But appreciate when, in the context here, uh, Joshua 1, 1 through 9, Crossing our Jordans is not an end, but a beginning. They got to cross the Jordan River. Was Joshua's job over once they got across the Jordan River? No, he was just getting started. Uh, anybody remember, they, as soon as they get across the Jordan River, the first place they go is Jericho. What does God tell them? First battle is mine. The first victory is mine. Nobody take anything. And what do they can do? He acted just like God hadn't said anything. He took some stuff and hid it in his tent. And could, that's the thing that would have gave me trouble. The whole family had to pay for what Achan did. I didn't even know he took the stuff. He, he took it and, and, and was hiding it. And now we got to pay the penalty for it. Now, if you grew up with siblings, you probably had that experience where one of your siblings did something and... Well, okay, since nobody won't fess up, all of you bite the bullet for it. And I'm of the mind that that kind of evens out because I was probably the person that did it and my brothers didn't know about it at some point. Uh, but Joshua 1, verse 8, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have success. Now, this is God telling Joshua, your job is way more than just leading these people across the Jordan River. When you get across the river, make sure you follow my law. If you follow my law, you're going to, man, this plan is going to go like clockwork. You're going to run into an enemy and just wipe them out and then move on to the next one and meet them and wipe them out. Is that how it happened? When, well, when they listened to God, that's how it happened. When they disobeyed God, the story read a little different. Uh, in fact, you read about AI. Look, AI, look, they didn't, we don't even need the whole army to beat AI. We just take a few folk and rub them out. And they got chased home. And then Joshua was like, Lord, you said, and God like, look, why, why, why am I the problem? Did you ever think that maybe y'all didn't do what I told you? Don't we think that way sometimes when stuff happens? Lord, why is God the fall guy? Why, why is this something God did? Maybe I'm the problem. God never is. So uh, they have to cross the Jordan, but God says you still got to be faithful to me uh, even when you get over to the Jordan and appreciate Even though God is telling him how this thing is going to happen, the battles were no less real. When you go out and face an enemy and they waving swords and shooting arrows and all that kind of thing. Now, God said we're going to win, but I still see them arrows whizzing through the air. 
The battle is no less real. Think about it in our case. Hadn't God told us he's going to take care of us? Do you have a tense moment or two when you get out there? Yeah, Because life is no less real, even though we have God's promises. But now we need to be careful that we don't make God say something uh, he didn't say. Now, God has promised us the victory in Christ Jesus. He has not promised us that everything is going to work out the way we want it to work out. So when something don't work out the way I want it to work out, don't, you know, be disappointed. Talking about, I'm, I'm, I'm a member of the church. I'm a Christian. How can this be happening to me? Well, did God tell you you'd never have uh, a trial or trouble? We got Brother Foster here again. I think this is very good for the application, today's application, and that is how that sometimes we in the church, we start to say close to, up to, and not realizing that even way back here, he was saying to us, you must observe. You have to stay with the book. And that was what he was telling him, is that if you get over here and you start deviating from what is written, you're gonna get in trouble. And we can see in our time now, when the churches get in trouble, is because they have deviated from the word. Yeah, 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 absolutely. How does God say you grow the church? Evangelizing. What do folks start trying to do? Gimmicks? Putting on a show? And guess what happens when you do that? It's going to blow up on you. Uh, Brother Holt, then Brother Wong. I was just going to comment, kind of piggybacking off of what you just said. It's The scriptures tell us almost, well, not almost, but quite the opposite about having to suffer. Jesus came mm -hmm. to suffer. Mm -hmm. Like it says, and I know it's somewhere in John, where it talks about no servant is greater than the master. master. So uh, he let us know that there's going to be some yeah, verse, rough spots uh, and dry chapter patches. Chapter 16, verse 33, he tells him point blank, in the world, you're going to have tribulation. Yeah, you're going to have trouble. Absolutely. Uh, Brother Wong? No. no? We're pointing over this way. Who? Oh, Sister Ah, okay. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to take a moment and reflect on what Brother Foster said. This the concept of them crossing the Jordan, which is similar to them crossing the Red Sea, which is kind of likened unto baptism because, you know, there's water on both sides and the cloud is covering them. And then he says, be careful to observe all. And it's very interesting because when you go to Matthew chapter 28, verse 28, and he tells us, I'm sorry, verse 18, and he tells them to baptize everybody in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So he goes on in verse uh, 20 and he says it again teach, teaching them to observe all things mm -hmm. that I have commanded you yeah. and it's almost like when God was saying I am with you he says and lo I am with you always even to the end of the earth so just like God was with Joshua mm -hmm. as long as they were doing everything he was always with them he is with us all the time but we have to observe all, all that he has commanded it. yeah great observation uh, especially you know, teach them to observe all, not just the stuff they like, not just the things that are convenient, but teach them to observe all. Yeah, teach them to love their enemies. Teach them to turn the other cheek. Yeah, some of what God says we might do anyway. And then some of what he says, if we are honest, we only do it because he said it. Yeah. How many people here would go out of your way to uh, be, be, be good to your enemies? They say, I don't do that now. <laughs> well, I say to you, love your enemies, Matthew 5, 44. Yeah, that's what God has called us to do. Yeah. So looking more uh, at what God has tasked Joshua with. Now, I know I clicked it. I'm, I'm scared if I click it again, it's going to go forward. And I clicked it again. And again, yep, yeah, please. Yep, thank you. Uh, so God was calling Israel to do much more than cross a river. Now, crossing the Jordan was a miraculous event, especially in light of the fact that it had overflowed its banks. Uh, but God was also doing something to Israel in their crossing uh, the Jordan River. 
Uh, I like the point Sister Abba made about baptism. God does something to our sins when we are baptized. He washes them away by the blood of Christ Jesus. But he also wants to do something to us. So he deals with the sins, but he's also dealing with us at the same time. This is what uh, Israel is facing. Yeah, I'm going to do something to the river, but I also want to do something to you all. I'm going to demonstrate my power to you all again so you have yet another reason to trust me. Because when you get over there to fight them big folk, uh, reason is going to tell you you can't do it. But remember, I, when you were in Egypt, I, I prevailed, we, you prevailed through me, uh, led you 40 years in the wilderness, you got to the Jordan River, there was no way you could have crossed that by yourself. God has just given them reason to trust him. So, so I'm going to give you another reason uh, to trust me. One of the things that we don't always appreciate, God wants better for us and usually better than we want for ourselves. I uh, worked that time. John 10.10, 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundant. God wants us to live well. Not necessarily mean be rich, but he wants us to live well. Yeah, I want you to live without fear. I want you to have peace. I want you to have all the spiritual blessings that are in Christ. I want you to have all those things. Now, the question is, will we take them? He offers it to us, but he doesn't force it on us. He doesn't, he doesn't make us take it. Uh, we have to uh, accept it by faith and, uh, and obedience. Uh, what's significant about God wanting to do something to Israel is that having better means being better. Don't we have better in Christ Jesus than we did when we were dead in sin? Doesn't God call us to be better in Christ than we were when we were dead in sin? Having better means being better. Uh, think about it if you, if you ever had, uh, if you grew up where you had play clothes and dress clothes, your dress clothes were better. When you put on the dress clothes, guess what? You had to be better. Then you got in your play clothes, you climb a tree, crawl under a stump, whatever, because you got your play clothes on. When you put your dress stuff on, now you got to be better. Look, I don't even want to do stuff that might put a hole in the knee. I'm going to be very careful. I'm going to be better because now I have better. So in life, if, if God is going to give us better, we have to be better. Uh, and appreciate crossing the Jordan wasn't just a shift uh, in their situation. It necessitated a shift in their character. You know what? We really need to get down to the business of trusting God. I mean, we done murmured and complained and grumbled for 40 years. And the younger generation even learned it from the older one. When we get over the other side of the Jordan, we, we need to start being better so that God can give us better. And God blessing us in our dilemmas is about more than just being delivered from whatever the, uh, the dilemma might be. I want you to learn something. Number one, trust me. Uh, number two, share what I've done for you with somebody else so that they can trust me too. So God talks to Joshua here, Joshua uh, 1 through 9, and it's a multifaceted call that he gives uh, to Joshua. Number one, calls them to claim the land. Get a reader there again. We're going to reread some of it. Three through. Brother, Brother Bill, I had you just right. You were in the, uh, on deck for a while now. Joshua 1, 3 through 4. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I have given it to you just as I spoke to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, and the land of the Hittites, and as far as the great sea toward the setting of the sun will be your territory. This has to be comforting to Joshua because God says, just like Moses, it's the same way I'm dealing with you. Well, Joshua had watched for 40 years God be faithful at every turn when he was dealing with Moses. Who, who did Moses' trouble come from? 
Israel. Yeah, Moses' problems never came from God. Joshua, God is telling Joshua, you're never going to have a problem with me. Now, you know, they are who they are, but that's why you need me uh, on your side. I want to be careful to say uh, when God talks to Joshua here uh, that this is by no means name it and claim it. I'm sure everybody in here has heard name it and claim it. Uh, you hear people talk around, uh, you know, I, I tell God what I want and I'm claiming it as if somehow God is obligated to give us something just because we said I want it. That would be akin, if you have a small child or if you've ever been entrusted with the care of a small child, that would be akin to them going into the mall and saying, I want that. And you got to get it just because I said I want it. That's not how it works. Uh, if you just go in and say, I want something. Uh, in fact, me and my three brothers, sometimes we got that pep talk before we went in the store. Don't touch nothing, don't look at nothing, and you ain't getting nothing. So you go in and you come out with the same thing you went in with, nothing. Well, and that wasn't true, because usually we came out with like some groceries or something that we were going to have some fellowship in uh, later on. But it wasn't name it and claim it. Uh, Israel didn't claim anything that God hadn't first named. God is the one who does the naming. We don't ever tell God, I want that and I'm claiming it. Who do you think you're talking to? You don't just come in and tell me what you want. You know, even the things I give you are by grace. And where do you have the gall to come in and, and demand uh, something? And I don't think our religious world thinks the thing through is just popular, name it and claim it. I heard a lady say one time, uh, apparently she had gone to the doctor and the doctor told her she had cancer. And she said, but I'm not claiming it. Now, you don't want to be insensitive, but I'm thinking, you don't have to claim it. It's going to claim you. But that's how people think uh, uh, sometimes. Yeah. Now, do I believe God could heal the person of cancer? Yeah, if he so chose to, absolutely. But you ain't going to sit there and tell God what he got to do. Uh-uh. We pray, and at that is not my will, but your will be done. So I'm asking, and even though I'm asking, I understand the final decision is yours. That's the spirit uh, that we uh, ought to pray with. So that name it and claim it is not biblical. And I just dropped that in there as we were uh, uh, going by. So God has told them, I'm going to give you everywhere your foot treads, uh, from Lebanon to the Euphrates, to the land of the Hittites, to the Mediterranean Sea, all of that I'm giving to you. You just got to do what I tell you. It's a done deal other than that. Life for us is a done deal if you stop and think about it. If we obey God, the necessary result is that we're going to go to heaven. If we obey, that's a done deal. That's easy to stand here and say is when you get out there and have to start living, that's when it starts to get uh, a little more complicated. Yeah, but God wants the very best for us. Uh, one of the things that God offers to us Uh, that's a short one, so I'll take that. John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. You really have to read that in context to appreciate the magnitude of it. I would venture that the disciples were going through the most trying night of their lives at the time that Jesus makes this statement. Uh, when you think about all that happened that night, uh, Jesus, first of all, is very, at one point is very sorrowful. I don't know that they've ever seen him like that before. Uh, you know, something must be going on if, if, if he's troubled. Uh, he tells Judas, you're going to betray me. Now, of course, they don't know what that means. In hindsight, we know exactly what Jesus is talking about. 
But remember, they're living in the moment, so they don't know. You know, one of you is going to betray me. When? Uh, you know, Peter goes so far as to say, look, even if all the rest of them run away from me, I'll never do that. And he tells Peter, before the night is over, you're going to deny me three times. Well, what's going to happen tonight that I will do such a thing? It's, it's always easy when you look in, in retrospect, especially because we know how it turns out, you know, that everything. But imagine they living in the moment and all these things are going on. And Jesus says, peace, I leave with you. Peace where? Man, everything you done said to us tonight has been troublesome. You, somebody going to betray you. I'm going to deny you. You leaving? Uh, how you, how you leaving peace with us? If they had believed what Jesus had been telling them all along, uh, they, they'd have been a little better off. Now, they finally got it, uh, but they didn't have it uh, at this point. But I, I put that there to stay. There's a difference between what God gives to us uh, and what we accept. Now, Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says what? In fact, I got this. Um, I'm gonna, uh, well, let me hold it for a second. Uh, let me just read what I got here so I can do that. Uh, there's a difference between what God gives or offers to us and what we accept. Israel, by faith, had to cross the Jordan and subdue the inhabitants of the land. Now, how were they going to get across the river, especially with it overflowing its banks? Uh, how were they going to be the people that was superior to them? That wasn't their job. That was God's job. God promised it to him. God was the one who had to fulfill that. You just need to do what I tell you. Get ready to cross the river and then fight them folk when you get on the other side. You don't have to worry about how you're going to win or how you're going to get across the river. That's, that, that's my part. Uh, so now here we have Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Uh, I see another hand. Uh, Read it. Okay, in the back here. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. This scripture is no more of a challenge for us than it was to cross the Jordan for Israel. Now, what does God tell us? Don't worry about anything. Bring it to me in prayer. Do we worry? Sure we do. Uh, sometimes that's why our blood pressure is through the roof. We're worried about everything. Uh, and appreciate what Paul is saying here, be anxious. He's saying, don't fret. Uh, don't be like Israel was when they didn't have anything to eat or drink. Oh, my goodness, you dragged us out here to die because there was nothing to eat. Uh, in, uh, because there were no graves in, in Egypt. Paul is telling us, don't act like that. Now, he, he's not telling us, don't care about anything. He's telling us, don't fret, don't whine. Rather than do that, take it to God in prayer. That's challenging to do with some things. Uh, just like it was challenging for Israel. God said, y'all going to cross the river. Uh, you look at that river, and you're wondering, how in the world are we going to get all these people uh, across this river. Well, we're not. God is. Sometimes that's the mistake we make. We, we, it's beyond my power. And because it's beyond my power, in my mind, it's also beyond God's power, uh, which is a uh, false conclusion. So uh, do not worry. It's a command that must be followed by faith. And prayer is a demonstration of faith. Do we ever inform God of anything? Do you ever pray to God and God said, you know, I didn't know that. I didn't see that coming. Man, how did that happen? You, you don't ever pray to God and that's God's reaction. By the time we pray to God about it, God is already in the future. I handle that one. That's what, you, that's what you're concerned about. I've already taken care of it. But we need to, this thing just vibrated. Does that mean the batteries can we go dead? Oh, is that a new signal to let me know I'm that cell phone? I shouldn't have asked. In that case, it didn't vibrate. It just didn't feel. Okay. 
So we can, uh, this actually be kind of an even place. When we read Philippians 4, 6, and 7, uh, we need to read that in the same way that Joshua and Israel needed to receive uh, God's promise about crossing the Jordan. God's part is God's part. I need to leave God's part to God. What did God tell me to do? Don't worry. Bring it to me in prayer. God, how are you going to fix it? That's my part. You don't have to worry about that. You just bring it to me in prayer. And we have trouble doing our part. And here we are concerned about how God is going to do uh, his part. And so I hope we see uh, next, next Wednesday, Lord willing, is the 30th, tonight, the 23rd. What is it? 24th? Oh, so then that would make next Wednesday, May the 1st, right? Yeah. Ooh, we'll be in the May already. All right, so I'm going to mark there. The Lord willing, we'll start there. Uh, and that'd be the last month for us to try to uh, get into Canaan, conquer all the cities, and then see how they lived uh, after that. So, but remember, God's part is God's part. Our part is don't fret, bring it to him in prayer. How God is going to fix it is for God to take care of. And the thing is, he's already taking care of it. Do we trust uh, his faithfulness? All right, so can we get a brother to... Let us pray. Father God, we... Thank you for this blessed night. We thank you for this opportunity to gather together tonight to study your word. Father, we thank you for Brother Cook and his ability to rightly divide our truth. We thank you for everyone under the sound of my voice. Praying, O oh Father, that we take to heart uh, the things that uh, we heard tonight and help us to apply it to our lives and live accordingly. It's in the mighty name of Jesus the Christ we pray and we give all thanks. Let the church say, Amen. Hi, this is Ricky Cook, one of the ministers here at the Laurel Church of Christ. We're glad you've chosen to watch our video broadcast. We'd also like to invite you to join us for in-person worship. We have worship services at 8 a.m. and another at 10.30 a.m. every Sunday morning. We also have a worship service in Spanish at 1 p.m. Sunday afternoons. Bible class is on Sunday at 9.30 a.m., and on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m., we have Bible class in both English and Spanish. Please know that you're always welcome here. We look forward to seeing you.